All right, so today's uh, talk is on C.S. Lewis's uh, inaugural lecture as chair of, uh, at Cambridge University of a chair that was created for him, a professorship um, for medieval and Renaissance literature in 1954. Uh, in terms of background, Lewis had, up until this stage, worked his entire academic life at Oxford University. He'd studied there as well. And he jumped to the other university, as they say. This is how they refer to one another. Oxford refers to Cambridge as the other university and vice versa. They don't even name it. It's the other university, condescension. Um, Lewis had been blocked <coughs> from a post at Oxford for all manner of reasons that it would probably take a lot of uh, study to get into. But he had been kept from that position, and there are certain perks that come with a chair um, and a professorship. In North America, everybody at the lowest rank is called a professor, even if they don't have a doctorate. Uh, an ordinary instructor, you just call a professor. In, the, in, in Britain and in uh, on the continent, a professor is at the top of the chain, <coughs> and uh, there are only a few of those, and they occupy a chair, and the cha chair is usually endowed, and it's named after somebody, and it's associated with a particular area. Um, so Tolkien occupied the Bosworth chair, a uh, very prestigious uh, chair for Anglo-Saxon, etc. And um, and it's usually the preeminent scholar in the field that's going to go after these chairs because there's prestige associated with it. There is money, but it's more prestige. With the prestige there comes when you publish something, everybody's ready to circulate it. To some degree, uh, modern technology gets around that, a little bit. Because you can go directly to the audience. You don't, have to rec you don't need uh, the printing press anymore. You can actually use, as Jordan Peterson is showing, YouTube to get to people. Like it's reaching people with, with speed and without the gatekeepers. But that a chair in the past had that go with it. It got to your audience. It, it was helpful in disseminating your thought, etc. So he was denied that chair at Oxford. He got one at Cambridge. Not only did he get one, it was one that was specifically created for him because of his particular gifts. And the particular gifts we looked at in the last uh, few lectures in the discarded image. He was talking about medieval and Renaissance thought, right? And the reason it was created is because he thought that the divide between them was largely illusory. It was not a real divide. It's not that there were no differences, but they weren't so significant that you should see a hard and fast division between them. And that he, he says in this lecture that that change has taken place over his own lifetime. What he doesn't say with, with modesty, I think, is that he is one of the chief reasons why the opinion changed on the subject. <laughs> but he quotes somebody else, Professor uh, Sesnick, in his own words, as the Middle Ages and the Renaissance come to be better known, the traditional antithesis between them grows less marked. And he says, some scholars might go further than him, but very few would now oppose him. OK, so the collapse between the distinctions there. Um, and a great deal of continuity. But he's been given this chair for this. And so what he, what he decides to do is to deal with the issue of categorizing time or, or ages, etates, as he calls them. By the way, he says that the divide between the two is largely due to propaganda from the humanists. And when, when we say humanists, he means it not in the sense of the Renaissance, but rather of the modern humanists, such as the, the, the authors of the Humanist Manifesto in, his, in the 20th century, which is atheistic. So humanism in that sense, not humanism in the sense of Dante and Petrarch and uh, I guess Thomas Aquinas, there's a sort of a humanism there that we call the Renaissance in Italy, which then eventually comes to England in the 16th century, which is contemporaneous with the Reformation. They're all humanists, right? So he's not saying 
uh, those humanists, he's talking about his, what, what his contemporaries mean by humanists and what they themselves call themselves, rather than those wedded to a theological view of, of things, we are promoting humanism. And if, if you want to look up the Humanist Manifesto, you can see it right there. The name will sound rather familiar. His name's Huxley, Aldous Huxley's brother. Um, at any rate, uh, he wants to talk about the uh, distinction between ages and how we come to this division. And he is going to say in this lecture, which is not just a lecture, I think it is a statement, that again, just like the discarded image is helpful for understanding all of Lewis's thought, that's why I'm focusing on the course. I would love to have done a lot of the short essays he writes because they're so good. But again, it's just a semester long course. But this one seems to me to, to have a outsized uh, effect in describing the whole trajectory of his thought. He wants to categorize the age. How do we dis call it and where does the great divide come? Again, the humanists put the great divide between the medieval period and the Renaissance period. And we'll say the medieval period is marked by belief and the Renaissance by reasoning. This is an enlightenment, anti-religious, mot mot motivated designation, which has now collapsed. Scholars no longer accept it. Why did they ever accept it? Because they didn't know the material. C because they assumed that the designation was correct uh, and then found reason to verify their prejudices, basically. So there's no great divide there. Where is the great divide? Because this is, he thinks that there is a great divide. By the way, this lecture was also delivered in a radio broadcast called The Great Divide for the BBC. Because at this point, again, Lewis is a national figure because of the radio talks he gave during the Second World War and other things. He, he is a national figure by this point, of great interest across the Atlantic. So Americans have become conscious of C.S. Lewis as a, uh, as a defender of the faith as well. And, and I think Lewis uh, took that seriously. I also thought he was slightly uncomfortable with it. Um, and uh, Tolkien called him every man's theologian, and I think he meant that rather disparagingly. Right? You're not a theologian. You talk about things that you're not entirely uh, expert in, and uh, you probably miss them, some things sometimes. So at any rate, that's the position he finds himself in. He has to operate accordingly, and he does so. So he takes the title from Isidore of Sevilla, Sevilla in Spain, is a medieval scholar. And he says in that chapter, Isidore is engaged in dividing history as he knew it into its periods, or as he calls them, etates. I shall be doing the same. So if it's not between the, the medieval and the Renaissance, where is the great divide to be found? He wants to make first a caveat, word of warning. He is not going to be engaging in philosophy of history. He's not going to do a Hegelian thing. He's not going to write um, Oswald Spengler in the uh, late, at the end of the First World War, writes The Decline and Fall of the West. It's very doom and gloom, right? It's, it's a reading of the whole of history, where it's going, etc. He's not trying to go about that. He says he's intensely, he says, I am a des desperate skeptic, quote, of those approaches. He says, I know nothing of the future, not even whether there will be any future. I don't know whether past history has been necessary or contingent. I don't know whether the human tragic comedy is now in act one or act five. Whether our present disorders are those of infancy or of old age, I am merely considering how we should arrange or schematize those facts, ludicrously few in comparison with the totality which survived to us, often by accident, from the past. I am less like a botanist in a forest than a woman arranging a few cut flowers for the drawing room. So he's, he's to some degree, 
expressing his, uh, the reasons why we should doubt what he's saying. There's a limit to what my knowledge on the subject is. Having said that, he is the Oxford, uh, or, or rather he is now the chair of the medieval renaissance and he's regarded as a world expert on these matters by wide acclaim. So if he can't speak to it, who can? But I think his reasons for expressing his reservations are legitimate. He knows he doesn't know everything uh, and, and, and can't for that matter. So what, is the po what are the possibilities? Well, one of them is the obvious one between antiquity and the dark ages. So between what we call the pagan world of Greece and Rome and the ages in which the Roman Empire falls with the sacking of Rome, and the barbarian invasions. Uh, the fall of the empire, the barbarian invasions, the christening of Europe. That's the first obvious divide. And he says, and of course, no possible revolution in historical thought will ever make this anything less than a massive and multiple change. Do not imagine I, that I mean to belittle it, yet I must observe that three things have happened since, say, Gibbon's time, and I'll say more on that in a second, which make it a shade less catastrophic for us than it was for him. But let me just stop for a second. This man is a Christian, and he, is, he says, and this is a very interesting thing to note, if you asked any Christian what the great shift in consciousness was in human history, they're always going to be putting it right where he said it would be, which is between antiquity and Christendom, marked by the Dark Ages. Now, he doesn't say Christendom, he says the Dark Ages. The, so the sacking of Rome. Uh, I've been a Christian now for, I don't know how many years, how many years, it's 25, thereabouts. And I've heard pastors repeatedly talk about wanting to go back to the primitive church. What was the early church like? That's the aim the worship and practice of the early church. We can uh, go, go back to that, perpetuate that, and get over the preceding centuries or the intervening centuries. That's, that's the explicit aim. So what that says to me without m any commentary on that, um, it's infeasibility, it's uh, utopian desires, it's, it's strange way of engaging with culture. Um, it is saying, something about our contemporaries that they are not where Lewis is on this because they see the great divide back then, right? But he mentions Gibbon. Now, Gibbon writes the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and his thesis is that the reason that the Roman Empire fell, it declined and then fell, was because of Christianity. Christianity weakened Roman virtue. I've read the book. It's on my shelf. It's a big book. And it's, a, and it's a brilliant book, actually. It is very brilliant. I just disagree with the thesis as he presents it, but it's still, it is brilliant and it's well written. Um, that the Romans, over time, and particularly, first of all, there, are, there is genuine problems amongst the emperors. They have a series of bad emperors. But the fatal error was, was Christian teaching uh, on loving your neighbor and so forth. And, and, and the doctrine of charity and so forth. This weakened the Roman virtues, etc. Now, Gibbon's thesis has been debunked later by other writers. Um, and I could, we could talk about that, but that's not what this course is about. Um, but that's his thesis. So this is the great divide. This is Gibbon's thesis. Note that an atheist holds the same view as Christians do. It's just the evaluation's the opposite. For him, it's a catastrophe. For them, it's also a catastrophe, but for a different reason. What does he say in relation to Gibbon? He says this, it's a shade less catastrophic for us than it was for him. One, the partial loss of ancient learning, learning and its recovery at the Renaissance were, for Gibbon, both unique events. because Gibbon is writing in the 18th century. So nothing, ha up to this point, there had been no, nothing like it. There's no precedent for what had happened. History furnished no rivals to such a death and such a rebirth. So the death is that of antiquity, 
and, as, and, and the way it was held on to in the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire was killed off, then the Dark Ages ensued, and there was just this black void, and then the Renaissance happened. So it's a rebirth, literally, re Renaissance of that ancient world. That's what it represented to him. So Christianity was responsible for the weakening of that. Then it died off, and then there was a revival of pagan learning, and what made it good was its paganism. That's the take on it. Now, it is the take of an atheist writing in the 18th century. It's also the take of the atheists in the 20th century, and it's the view presented in the academy, by and large. The Renaissance is a return to classical learning. What they don't note is that, it, particularly in the English Renaissance, it is fused with Christianity and Puritan thought at that. All of the reformers are humanists. They're taught in, they, they're, they, they study in humanist schools. They're steeped in ancient languages. They've read the great books. When I say the great books, not the great book, but the great books. Homer, Virgil, all of Plato, Aristotle, this has all been recovered. And they're reading the text in the original. And they're reading them as Christians. And they are taking different lessons than those of the ancient world. Uh, Gibbon ignores all that because he reads it differently. That's fine. But the, in the Renaissance, they don't, by and large. The Renaissance is full of Christians. They might be divided between Catholics and, and uh, those of the Reformation, but they are all in agreement that Christianity is superior to antiquity in various ways. But, but Gibbon is writing in the 18th century, and what Lewis is going to say is that the Great Divide comes after Gibbon, so of course he sees it. That's why he places such great weight there. Um, and he says, in our time, we have lived to see the, the second death of ancient learning. The second death. In our time, something which was once the possession of all educated men has shrunk to being the technical accomplishment of a few specialists, the men, the men and women that study classics. That's it. And how many people do that? Almost none. They don't even read the books in translation. So we, we've actually experienced a second death of ancient learning in our own time. Now, he's writing this in 1954. We're 70, almost 70 years later. It's that much more so. If we say that this is not total death, it may be replied that there was no total death in the Dark Ages either. In fact, this is my addition, in the monasteries, they were preserved. All the texts that we have were preserved in the Western monasteries or in Eastern Christianity, where it had never died. And it only came back into contact with the West when the, when the Muslims who had uh, taken Eastern Christianity then moved into Western Christendom and the, the two came together. And so they got uh, acquaintance with Homer, which they had never read. In, in Western Christendom, they had never read Homer. They'd heard about him. They cited him as the great Homer, but they hadn't read Homer. And much of Aristotle, much of Plato, the only thing that they had in, in the West from Plato was the Timaeus. I would show you, if it didn't take up time right now, the uh, portrait of the School of Athens, famous by Raphael. I'll, I'll do that some other class. But he says, um, it could even be argued that Latin surviving as the language of Dark Ages culture, because all of these people are still writing in Latin, even though they, don't, they, they have different other local dialects and languages, it, and preserving the disciplines of law and rhetoric, gave to some parts of the classical heritage a far more living and integral status in the life of those ages than the academic studies of the specialists can claim in our own, because who is influenced by the classical scholars of our day? Does anyone? have any influence? I struggle to find many. So there's a second death that's happened in our area uh, or in our time. Secondly, to Gibbon, the literary change from Virgil to Beowulf or the Hildebrand, if he had read them, would have seemed, which he wouldn't have, by the way, Beowulf's discovered in the 19th century, um, if he had read, would have seemed greater than it can to us. We can now see quite clearly that these barbarian poems were not really a novelty compared to, say, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot or Mr. Jones' Anathemata. They were rather an unconscious return to the spirit of the earliest 
classical poetry. So Beowulf is returning to the roots of ancient classical poetry, even though it's not influenced by Greco-Roman, it, it adopts the same principles. So the audience of Homer and the audience of the Hildebrand, once they had learned one another's language and meter, would have found one another's poetry perfectly intelligible. Nothing new had come into the world. And then finally, the christening of Europe seemed to all our ancestors, whether they welcomed it themselves as Christians or, like Gibbon, deplored it as humanistic unbelievers, a unique, irreversible event. So when Gibbon writes, as an atheist, he is on the margin of his culture. He cannot imagine that Christianity will ever be behind him. Can't imagine it. He hates it, he wants it gone, but it's not possible for him to conceive that it will ever be gone because it's so influential. It's transformed so many things. We're never going to be able to go back to that uh, day when Christianity had no influence. But we have seen the opposite process. Of course, the unchristening of Europe in our time is not quite complete. Neither was her christening in the Dark Ages. But roughly speaking, we may say that whereas all history was for our ancestors divided into two periods, the pre-Christian and the Christian, only those two, for us it has three, the pre-Christian, the Christian, and the post-Christian. He's the first man to use the word post-Christian to my knowledge. We live in the post-Christian era. Now it's not entirely post-Christian, but it is marked by a significant move away from this, a departure. And it's interesting, it also is marked by a departure of the death of classical culture. Isn't that interesting? Those two things happen together. And note also that Lewis is a classics scholar by background. He becomes a medievalist, but he was trained in the classics. And he says, it was once two, now it's three. The pre-Christian, the Christian, and now the post-Christian. So we look at things very differently than Gibbon. And he says, this surely make, must make a momentous difference. I am not here considering either the christening or the unchristening from a theological point of view. I am considering them, considering them simply as cultural changes. When I do that, it appears to me that the second change is even more radical than the first. Even more radical. Now, this is, this is key to Lewis's thought. Because his assertion, which um, I once thought doubtful and now increasingly think is correct, Christians and pagans had much more in common with each other than either has with a post-Christian. The gap between those who worship different gods is not so wide as between those who worship and those who do not. There is a huge divide. There are no atheists in the ancient world. Christians are called atheists by the polytheists of Rome because they worship only one god. They're called atheists because they deny all of the gods because they, and they worship only one god. Well, that, so they just call them atheists. But truly, they are only monotheists. Now, he makes a really interesting statement here, and I'm going to emphasize this because I think it is a really interesting way of looking at the commonality between the pagan and the Christian ages. He says, these alike are ages of what Pausanias would call dromenon. What does he mean by this? The externalized and enacted idea. It's an idea, which an idea, a thought, an ideal, which is put into practice. How is that idea put into practice? The sacrifice, the games, the triumph, the ritual drama, the mass, the tournament, the mask, the pageant, the epithalamium, which is a marriage um, hymn, and with them ritual and symbolic costumes, trabea and laticlave, crown of wild olive, royal crown, coronet, judge's robes, knight's spurs, herald's uh, tabard, 
coat, armor, priestly vestment, religious habit for every rank, trade, or occasion, it's visible sign. We just saw that in the funeral with Queen Elizabeth II. Those are medieval trappings. They're enacted ideas, externalized. People are in awe. There's a sense of the transcendent <coughs> working its way out into the imminent and what they see are all around them. It's, it's an idea that is enacted and note how it was enacted. It's, it's awesome as a spectacle. <coughs> and you don't see it, it's like anymore, anywhere. Five, million, five billion turned in to watch that. Biggest event in, in human history in terms of a spectacle then. And a funeral to a woman they'd never met, but represented something. Not just the past, more than that, I think. But he says, but even if we look away from that into the temper of men's minds, I seem to see the same. And then he refers to a few figures, I'll skip over that. So what is, so it's not that then. Uh, the next frontier is between the Dark and the Middle Ages. So the Dark Ages move up to about the 12th century. And then in the 12th, early 12th century, um, I mentioned this, the coming together of Eastern Christianity and Western Christianity, not through Christianity, but through Islam. Because they had operated as independent Christian uh, kingdoms, as it were, or empires. One based in Constantinople, the other based in Rome. And the Islamic conquest of Eastern Christendom started pushing further westward and at that point brought with them the men who could read uh, these ancient texts. They were the scribes, the Greek monks who had been rendered vassals of the Muslim empire, but they found them very useful and kept them along and they brought their scrolls with them to the west. This brought about a huge transformation in Western Christendom. The, the, the finest flower of that is Thomas Aquinas. Summa Theologica, it's had to vary summa. And, and there's a sort of a, a, a renaissance there. People talk about it in, in that term. And a, a great deal changes at that point. So it moves from the Dark Ages, so-called, to the Middle Ages, right then. The frontier clearly cannot compete with its predecessor in the religious field because it's still Christian. Uh, nor can it boast such drastic redistribution of populations, but it nearly makes up these deficiencies in other ways. Well, one of the changes um, is uh, the triumph of the codex. A codex is a book, a book that is hinged. It has a hinge at the back. You can open it. What does this allow you to do? I don't, you've probably never thought about it. They have scrolls in the ancient world. We have, they have writing. <coughs> They have vellum, they have papyrus, they have parchment, they have scroll, right? And they read from the scroll. So they can read, they can write. What they can't do is they can't cross-reference. In your Bible, you can open it up, you can see here, you can read on, and you can turn a page, and you can keep the page here, and you can go back and forth to it. So then you read intertextually, back and forth. Different books, 66 books, now you see them, the unity between them. You don't just have one scroll, you have all the scrolls presented there in a codex. It is transformative for learning. Absolutely transformative. Too little is made of that development because it doesn't seem like a great technological marvel and in a sense it isn't. But it, it does change scholarship a lot. And the codex, which brings scholarship together, by the way, in one volume and gives it a unity, has been lost with the internet. Because the internet destroys the unity. It's just information, not organized. There is no organization. Google is the organizing principle. Actually, your search is the organizing principle. What if you don't know what holds it all together? You will think that you found it just by, you did a search, keyword search, bang, there it is. So you think you have information there. You do, but how do you process it? How do you organize it? What does it mean? Not clear. Uh, this terrific book, Technopoly, talks about the uh, surrender of culture to technology, the, the transformation. I, I'm going to come back to this because what Lewis comes to in conclusion is going to build on that. But he says, so that's one of them. And the other may be something like the stirrup, which allows you to stay on your horse and ride with a a lance, or you're not going to fall off it. 
You can fight while on horseback. You don't just ride up. Because if you don't have stirrups, you don't have anything to keep your feet in, right? So you can't really swing from the horse. Never mind that. Uh, by and large, there is retrogression even in this period. The houses are worse. The drains are worse. The, there are fewer baths, worse roads, less security. And he notes that in this period in the Dark Ages that a, uh, the old swords are better than the new swords. So they know that things used to be better. And then come along the Middle Ages and there's a significant improvement across the board. So there is a huge shift there. And so that could be a possible uh, great divide. But he's not with that uh, as the next uh, likely frontier. What then? One final one. It's the one I just talked about in De Descriptione Temporum. Well, not that. Um, the discarded image. The shift uh, that comes towards the end of the 17th century with the onset of the great uh, royal society, with the acceptance of Nicholas Copernicus's astronomy, uh, with the dominance of Descartes, modern philosophy, that maybe that's the modern age. We call that the modern age, right? They're modern science, modern philosophy, modern astronomy, right? Those, so maybe it's there, late 17th century. And then that begins what we, we call the Enlightenment period. Maybe that's the great divide. And he says, indeed, if we were considering the history of thought in the narrower sense of the word, I believe this is where I would draw my line. But if we are considering the history of our culture in general, not just the history of thought, but now beyond just thought, if it's thought clearly, Descartes' revolution in thought is that. I talked about that. It's predicated on doubt rather than belief now. Before they believed in the in many gods or one god, but they had, it was founded on belief. Now it's going to be predicated on doubt. This is a huge shift, but that's in the realm of thought. Outside of that, to culture more general, then we have to look elsewhere. He says, certainly the sciences then began to advance with a firmer and more rapid tread. To that advance, nearly all the later and, in my mind, vaster changes can be traced. But the effects were delayed. The sciences, this is a key phrase to underline if you have it, the sciences long remained like a lion cub whose gambols delighted its master in private. It had not yet tasted man's blood. All through the 18th century, the tone of the common mind remained ethical, rhetorical, juristic, rather than scientific. The tone remained the same. They all sound like they've been trained in the classics. They all speak like lawyers. They all speak like rhetoricians. It's very florid language, very beautiful. They all read the classics. John Wesley uh, is taught to write in Greek and Latin, not just read it, but write it. He writes essays in Latin and poems in Latin and in Greek. He's taught that in school. It's going to have an effect on you, right? And you wouldn't have thought that Wesley, what? The guy that speaks to the common man? Yes, Mr. Wesley, trained that way. But he says, uh, and this is Dr. Johnson, could truly say the knowledge of external nature and the sciences which that nature requires or includes are not the great or the frequent business of the human mind. So he, he, that's how small the sciences are. The great thinkers don't preoccupy themselves with what we now call the sciences. There's a few dabblers that are sort of eccentrics. They're in the Royal Society. They do little experiments in bottles and they are very interested in those. But by and large, society is not interested in what they're doing. And he says this <coughs> famous phrase, science was not the business of man because man had not yet been become the business of science. It is easy to see why. It dealt chiefly with the inanimate, and it threw off few technological byproducts. When, I, when Watt makes his engine, when Darwin starts monkeying with the ancestry of man, and Freud with his soul, and the economists with, with all that is his, then indeed the lion will have got out of his cage. 
its liberated presence in our midst will, not, will become one of the most important factors in everyone's daily life, but not yet, not in the 17th century. It has not yet become the human sciences. Remember I talked about the human sciences, the Geist is Wissenschaften, however you want to call it. That's not until the 19th century. Sciences, yes, but they're relatively insignificant. They are not significant until the 19th century, and then they become all significant. And now he comes to this. It is by these steps that I've come to regard as the greatest of all divisions in the history of the West. That which divides the present from, say, the age of Jane Austen and Sir Walter Scott. Jane Austen, if you love Jane Austen, it sounds like it's a different world. That's because it is a different world. If you read something that's written 20 years later, it will sound rather contemporary. It's, it's way of looking at things. But Jane Austen, there's something very delightful and innocent and naive about it, where ethics hold, where gentlemen are expected to do certain things, where ladies expect gentlemen to do certain things, where dishonor is avenged, etc. There's very much the moral code that's still involved there. And he says, of course, I had no sooner reached this result than I asked myself whether it might not be an illusion of perspective the distance between the telegraph post I am touching and the next telegraph post looks longer than the sum of the distances between all the other posts. Could this be an illusion, like an optical illusion? We cannot pace the periods as we could pace the posts. I can only set out the grounds on which, after frequent reconsideration, I have found myself forced to affirm, reaffirm my conclusion. Why is that then? What's the biggest change? Well, he gives four reasons. And he's going to go from the weakest to the strongest. The weakest is political order. On this count, my proposed frontier would have serious rivals. The change is perhaps less than that between antiquity and the Dark Ages. Yet it is very great. And I think it extends to all nations, those we call democracies as well as dictatorships. If we wish to satirize the present political order, I would borrow for it the name which Punch, which is a humor magazine in England, invented during the First German War, Gouvertissement. Uh, rule by government. You don't even think it's funny because we expect the government to govern everything. Uh, Canadians in particular. Why doesn't the government do something about this? It's immediate response. Oh, the government's got to do this. There's a problem that's happened. You know, a, a cat has died on the streets. Better call somebody from the government to get the cat off the streets. That's not my responsibility. The government will take care of that. And somebody ha nobody's picked up that cat off the street. I'm going to phone 411 and complain that the cat's still on the street. He said, this is a portmanteau word and means government by advertisement. It markets itself as the answer to all problems. My intention is not satiric. I'm, not, I'm trying to keep objective. The change is this. In all previous ages that I can think of, the principal aim of rulers, except at rare and short intervals, was to keep their subjects quiet, to forestall or extinguish widespread excitement and persuade people to attend quietly to their several occupations. Just don't disturb them. You know, don't poke the bear. Just keep them quiet. That's their aim. And on the whole, their subjects agreed with them. We don't want to hear from you. They even prayed in words that sound curiously old-fashioned to be able to live a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. He's taking this from the prayer book, Anglican prayer book. And, quote, pass their time in rest and quietness. I heard people say this from the pulpit and elsewhere during covid we're to pray for those in authority, and we're to pray that we have uh, a peaceable life and all godliness and honesty. They kept praying that prayer. Even while the change in government was doing the exact opposite, making sure that they could not live those sorts of lives, because the political sphere had intruded into the private sphere. So there was no private sphere, and the internet coming into your homes has ensured that. They can hear me while I'm recording. 
They can also hear you on your smartphones. They can track you. He says, but now the organization of mass excitement seems to be almost the normal organ of political power. So before they wanted you to be quiet, now they want you to be excited. They, want, they talk about campaigns, right? political campaigns. We're gonna do drives. We're gonna, we're gonna have an agenda of change. Hope and change, we want you to get excited. We're gonna make things way better. The government is going to do this. If a government won't promise to do this, you say, why would I vote for you if you're not gonna change anything? Our rulers have become like schoolmasters and are always demanding keenness. And you notice that I'm guilty of a slight archaism in calling them rulers. Leaders is the modern word. Do you even know that? Leaders is, uh, is the German word for Führer, by the way. The leader. I've suggested elsewhere that this is a deeply, deeply significant change of vocabulary. Our demand on them has changed no less than theirs for us. For of a ruler one looks, asks justice, incorruption, diligence, perhaps clemency. Of a leader, what do we want from a leader? Dash, initiative, and what people call magnetism or personality. Have we got leaders in power or have we got rulers in power? We have leaders. They've got dash, they have initiative, they've got personality. They appeal to justice and so forth, but they don't do those things and they're not concerned with them. That's just, so that's the first, but he says that's the weakest change. The second is in the arts. He says, I cannot think of an any previous age produced where work that was in its own time as shatteringly and bewilderingly new as that of the Cubists, the Dadaists, the Surrealists, and Picasso has been in ours. Think about painting, modern painting. And I'm quite sure that this is true of the art I love best, that is of poetry. I'll skip over his discussion of this, but he is going to say that the change there is night and day. There is no comparison whatsoever. We move from the classical era to the romantic era and the post-romantic era, where, where rather than poetry being uh, appealing to certain standards and common virtues and the principle of mimesis or imitation, we're imitating reality, now we have self-expression. Everything's self-expression. I'm expressing myself in poetry. I want, to be a I want you to teach me to be a writer. How can I teach you to be a writer? Just be yourself. Do what comes naturally to you. Uh, thirdly, a great religious change. Well, he's already mentioned that, the unchristening. Unchrist you would have thought that would be the biggest one, biggest change, given what he's just said. We move from uh, pre-Christian to Christian to post-Christian. Well, then you would have thought the biggest change would become connected with the unchristening, but it's not for him. Surprise. Of course, there were lots of skeptics in Jane Austen's time and long before, as there are lots of Christians now. But the presumption has changed. In her days, Austen's days, some kind and degree of religious belief and practice were the norm. Now, though I would gladly believe that both kind and degree have improved, they are the exception. <coughs> I've already argued that this change surpasses which, that which Europe underwent at its conversion. It's hard to have patience with those Jeremiah's in press or pulpit who warn us that we are relapsing into paganism. Lewis hates this. He said it might be rather fun if we were. It would be pleasant to see some future prime minister trying to kill a large and lively white, milk white bull in Westminster Hall, but we shan't. We shan't see that. What lurks behind such idle prophecies, if they are anything but careless language, is the false idea that historical process allows mere reversal, that Europe can come out of Christianity by the same door as in she went and find herself back where she was. That's not what happens. A post-Christian man is not a pagan. You might as well think that a married woman recovers her virginity by divorce. Lewis is so good at analogies. The post-Christian is cut off from the Christian past and therefore doubly from the pagan past because Christianity is, a con is in continuity with uh, paganism. It just 
corrects it. The, the heart's affections, the desire and necessity of worship, it gets redirected to its proper end. Pagans were not wrong in believing that there were gods and that reverence was needed and that there are certain sanctities that needed to be preserved and, and there should be consequences if they were violated. The pagans believed that very strongly. They punished them very strongly. Christianity says, yes, but you're worshiping false gods. Not you're wrong to worship. You're worshiping false gods. So the post-Christian is cut off from the, 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 the very thought that you ought to worship anything. But that's not the most significant. The most significant one, and that he says his trump card, between Jane Austen and us, not between her and Shakespeare, Chaucer, Alfred, Virgil, Homer, or the Pharaohs comes the birth of the machines. There you go. The birth of the machines. There's the biggest shift. This lifts us into a region of change far above all we have hitherto considered. For this is parallel to the great changes by which we divide epochs of prehistory. This is on a level with the change from stone to bronze or from a pastoral to an agricultural economy. It alters man's place in nature. There is nothing quite like this. Last class I talked about in the discarded image about the old view of what was on earth in that old rendering, what human nature was like, right? But the advent of machines into our consciousness changes, alters man's place in nature. And this change, we are still living with the consequences of that. I think it has to do with the modern environmental movement. This is me, not Lewis. Um, it has to do with our response to, to COVID. There's a whole range of things that go along with that. Just with respect to COVID, note that up until this age, when I say up until this age, until 2019, when somebody was sick, you quarantined the person that was sick. I think, I, did I say this in class? I don't know. But you can find that in biblical times and it goes all the way throughout human history. It, it was, it's modern science. You, when you're sick, you isolate yourself while you're sick. You quarantine the sick until they no longer have symptoms and then you can return them into population. We did the exact opposite. We quarantined the healthy, unprecedented. Impossible without machines, by the way. I observed this at the time. If it had not from, been for Zoom and social media and whatever, nobody would, would have been able to function. We would never have moved to that solution of, of, of teaching online, of doing business online, of doing everything online, of staying in our homes and operating through the conduit of technology. Unthinkable, impossible. That solution would not have been there. And if you look at the results, uh, the deaths from COVID, they're nothing like as bad as um, past contagions. Like the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu struck down men in their 20s and 30s uh, in huge numbers after the, Second World, after the First World War. Huge numbers. And these were people who were parents of young children. Whereas COVID was striking down the very elderly. And they knew that very early on. It's very interesting thing. So without commenting on that particular thing, just notice the shift. That's the point here. Huge shift. And it's caused by machines and the effect that we have from machines. Now the machine was also used to predict the uh, calamitous outcome of the virus. It was the uh, RO scores, right? They're going to predict with, with uh, algorithms how bad the outcome of this. We trust the science. We, it wasn't the science, it was the algorithms projections. So the huge shift. The theme has been celebrated till we are sick of it. So I will say here nothing about its economic and social consequences, immeasurable though they are. What concerns us more is its psychological effect. How has it come about that we use the highly emotive word stagnation with all its malodorous and malarial overtones for what other ages would have called permanence? or not wanting to go back to the past, or not wanting to be stuck in the past. When, if somebody says, I don't want to be stuck in the past, or I don't want to go back to the past, everyone nods their head. Yes, that would be terrible. We would not want to go back to the past. It's an immediate, you don't even have to, you just throw it out as a trope, and you get immediate assent. We can't hold on to the past, because that would 
doom us to disease and stagnation and, and death, all the terrible things that go with that. He says, why does the word at once, that is permanence, suggest to us clumsiness, inefficiency, barbarity? When our ancestors talked of the primitive church or the primitive purity of our constitution, they meant nothing of that sort. The only pejorative sense which uh, Dr. Johnson gives to primitive in his dictionary is significantly formal, affectedly solemn, imitating the supposed gravity of old times. What do you get from the word primitive? What do you think of when you think of something primitive? You think rudimentary, basic, redundant, obsolete, useless, immediately, or a primate. All the vulgarity, the lack of manners, the lack of reason, the lack of culture that goes with it. So pr primitive, when, even when Christians thought we want to go back to the primitive church, everyone's sort of like, oh, um, I don't know about that. What exactly does that mean? Well, they mean it in, a, in, a, in the old fashioned sense, but nobody uses that word anymore. So those things, why does the latest in advertisements mean best? So this is the latest iPhone. Why does that mean it's the best iPhone? Well, because it is. But the latest with respect to everything is the best, right? Immediate, if I say this is the latest, the immediate emotional association is you're giving me the best because it's the newest, the latest. No, this is what he's saying. Well, let us admit that these semantic developments owe something to the 19th century belief in spontaneous progress, which itself owes something either to Darwin's theorem of biological evolution or to the myth of universal evolutionism, which is really so different from it and earlier. For the two great imaginative expressions of the myth, as distinct from the theorem, Keats's Hyperion and Wagner's ring cycle are pre-Darwinian. I've noted this in uh, a public lecture, that the uh, myth of evolution precedes Darwin's scientific theory of it, which means that Di Darwin's scientific theory was not based on facts so much, but as on hopeful ideas about the future, which he simply then found evidence for. And he said, let us give those that are due, but I submit that what has imposed this climate of opinion so firmly on the human mind is a new archetypal image. It is the image of old machines being superseded by new and better, better ones. For in the world of machines, the new most often really is better, and the primitive really is the clumsy. The first iPhone, of which I don't have one, you would say, well, isn't that neat? Do you actually want an old iPhone on your shelf or something like that? Nowadays, I think people are trying to get old Macs, like the first Mac that came out is a sort of a museum type piece, but totally obsolete, it's a brick, can't do anything, but it sort of looks, you look like this is a sign of progress. But it's a, a sign of progress in the sense that, that what my parents had when they were cutting edge is now nothing like where I'm at and I can look down on my parents. That's how far advanced we are. I have nothing to learn from you because you are not on the cutting edge. You don't know where things are now. And this image, potent in all, all our minds, including Lewis's, including mine, reigns almost without rival in the minds of the uneducated. There it reigns without rival. For to them, after their marriage and the births of their children, the very milestones of life are technical advances. They can remember when they got their iPhone whatever number. That their life is marked by technology when they got this video game, when they saw that film, whatever. From the old push bike to the motorbike and thence to the little car, and now we would say the electronic car or whatever. From the gramophone to the radio, from the radio to television, from the range to the stove, these are the very stages of their pilgrimage. But whether from this cause or from some other, assuredly that, that approach to life which has left these footprints on our language is the thing that separates us most sharply from our ancestors and whose absence would strike us as most alien if we could return to their world. 
So if we actually were able to go back in the time machine to the past, that would strike you the most, that they don't talk this way. They don't think this way. It would never occur to them that the newest thing was the best. It would be the exact opposite, actually. They did not prize originality. They didn't prize it. In fact, if it was original, it was almost certainly wrong. A new idea is a bad idea. Because if it were a good idea, it would have been thought before and people would have held on to it. So there have been a lot of people before us and we're no superior to, they, to them. In fact, they were, these were great people and they did not come upon this. So why on earth would we? And so there's a bias towards the young and the young always consider themselves to be superior to their parents and their grandparents, et cetera, in certain ways. And you can prove that by using the technology that your grandparents sit in front of them, like, I can't get this to work, can you help me? <laughs> of course. And then the grandparents marvel that their five-year-old can use the iPhone and they can't. They figure it out because it's actually pretty simple. So that is the big shift. So what does it push us towards? Well, it pushes, it's a very stark push against culture and education. And it, I said this in, uh, in my first year class, it pushes us towards a new sort of hero and the heroes are, are superheroes who are, without exception, orphans. So they don't, that, that's very helpful. Right? They don't have mom and dad around to tell them what to do, boss them around, consult with. But also they have superpowers. Where do the superpowers come from? Does it come from their character? No. Does it come from their natural abilities? No, it comes from some sort of infusion of technology or accident or whatever. Spider-Man bit by a rea radioactive spider and somehow that gives him super strength and he climb walls and he, you know, a certain uh, spidey sense. S Superman comes from another planet and the, and, the, and the yellow sun gives him his power, whatever. So that's a thing. We can't replicate that. Actually, we can't replicate any of the superheroes, with a few exceptions, if we had enough money. Tony Stark, Batman, maybe then, right? But pretty, and um, so Iron Man, Batman, they have, they're billionaires, mega billionaires, and they're also tech geniuses, right? Both cases. Tech geniuses, billionaires, and they use that to fight crime. What do they do? So they fight crime, that makes them the good guys. But in the case of Batman, he's got a bit of the dark side in him. So we're not sure whether he's on the right side or the bad side, he's the dark knight. Okay, in, in the case of the superheroes though, they fight crime, they fight injustice. Okay, that makes them good, but actually it doesn't. It only shows that they're against the good, but against the bad, but it never says what the good is. That's because it would have to appeal to virtues, which they don't have. They don't have virtues. Superman can't be killed. You don't have to be virtuous if you can't be killed. You don't have to be very brave. You need to, somebody punches you in the face, they're gonna break their hand. They don't have to be super courageous. He's just super strong. The only thing mysterious about Superman is why he cares at all. Why, why would he bother? So that's sort of, that's sort of nice. He cares about creatures, though he has no reason to do so. You know, later installments of it will give him romantic interests and all this sort of stuff. And, but in general, now that's not Superman. He doesn't have, he, does, he has no virtues. Other than he fights injustice. He doesn't like injustice. But then in justice and injustice are defined by virtue. They actually are. So if you can't hold up positive virtues, what you fight as injustice is, is eventually going to lose its potency and the whole series collapses, implodes upon itself. In the early 20th century, when the Marvel comics and those were created in 1945, those virtues are still alive in the US, Christian virtues. As they're in their, the 2020s, not so much. 
we can't identify with those heroes anymore then. We sort of are entertained by them, they can have funny dialogue, but they're no longer role models for us to aspire to because they have technical powers, uh, perhaps, which we don't have because we're not billionaires. Or they've been bitten by spiders or bathed in radiation or whatever is that transform them or become X-Men or all that, whatever, which we're not going to do either. But the push in all of those cases is to become supermen by investing in technology because then somebody will use that technology to solve all humanity's problems. So it pushes it in the direction of the conditioners that Lewis talked about in The Abolition of Man. We have nature whipped, right? That, that's the effect of this. Okay, so there is a huge divide. Where does this divide come from? Well, let me say this, and I got this. Uh, um, the new Western world, which is represented by the U.S., is about the self-made man. This is an American ideal, the self-made man, the man who pulls himself up by his own bootstraps. Um, Thomas Jefferson says that the uh, aim of government is to enlighten people. And if you enlighten people generally, tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish like evil spirits in the dawn of day. He's speaking for the enlightenment. All you have to do is get rid of tyranny and the oppressions of body and mind will vanish. That's what, that's, that's Jefferson. So, if you teach people the right things, they'll do the right things. Just teach them the right things and then they'll do it. And then the Civil War happens. I guess that didn't work. Uh, Intrinsic in, in Jefferson's view is the idea that tradition had nothing to teach us. We could just use reasoning. There's an anti-intellectualism there, a disdain for the elites there in the American spirit, a distaste for the old world. Um, and there's a sort of a sense that people who are practical are going to change the world. American pragmatism is the quintessential American philosophy. Thomas Dewey, uh, others there. So you teach them enough of the right things and then they'll do the right things. Well, this becomes then the dominant focus in, and here's where it comes to this class, evangelicalism. This is the dominant thrust of evangelicalism. It's anti-intellectual. It's anti-traditional. It favors technology. It favors the practical. It doesn't favor a culture. It favors the newest faddish things. It didn't notice that the Enlightenment uh, declined in its efficacy around the same time that Lewis charts, charts the rise of the machines. Didn't notice this. Sort of stayed uh, in an uh, anti-intellectualism which marked evangelicalism. So that Mark Knoll uh, talks about the scandal of the evangelical mind. That's his phrase. And what's the scandal of the evangelical mind? There, it doesn't have one. It doesn't cultivate it. It doesn't care about that. So are Christians going to come along board with Lewis's observations here, or are they just investing in technology and seeing technology as the way forward? I see in Christian circles as a Christian higher educator that uh, we're being, that everyone's going into STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that's the way of the future. Who says that? The conditioners will say that, right? Would a humanities scholar agree with this? Well, uh, C.S. Lewis is on the other side of the Great Divide. He speaks of himself as a dinosaur in the midst of his contemporaries. This is 1954. It's the same now. Like, I'm a dinosaur. Except the culture has declined since Lewis, and that includes me. I'm not Lewis, but I see what he's talking about. There's a decline there. The remedy for it then is, I, I talked about this just now, and let me flesh it out just a little bit, and then you, I want to hear where your comments are. Um, Lewis, rather than simply fighting evil, presented the good. Right? That we're, we're about to shift to Narnia, 
And Lewis combats uh, falsehood and heresy and misguided thinking in his apologetics works, and I think they're fantastic. But he moves people in his fiction where he does present things that are lovely and good and true. And he makes us want that things were that way, even though he knows that they're fictions. He also thinks that the fictions that he tells bear a correspondence to the world that he testified to in the discarded image in which he said sort of started disappearing come mid-19th century. But that's the way he thought it could be addressed by appealing to people to pursue vir virtue and wisdom. And so much that, uh, again, his, uh, the contemporary uh, psychologist, B.F. Skinner, saw him as the last and most potent representative of the life of freedom and virtue and said, we've had enough of that, we need to move beyond it. Well, Skinner was just saying what everybody even had been saying for at least 100 years, trying to push it away. Um, the only th the note that I think is hopeful here is that there has been a return to great books, studies in Christian circles. People are now interested in great books. I teach them myself. A long time people wondered why I even bother to do that. Within the Christian community, there's a push from administrators away from that because kids come out of high school and they don't want to, they want to read other things or they want to become creative writers and why don't we make it more practical? Let's teach people to be communication majors or whatever. Um, I think communication is, is great, but if you're going to have substance and if you're going to be part of Christianity uh, of the Lewis sort, you have to have what he had. It's not optional. It's, it's part of the package. Anyway, your thoughts. I've got, we've got five minutes here or thereabouts, I think. But this is a lecture, but he's really announcing, to, and I think if you've read any of Lewis's works, you can see how it's, it fits everywhere, right? You would think he's talking about his fiction. Yes? It sounds like what Lewis is doing is what Sidney talks about in his defense of poetry, where he's like, the poet presents the form of the good or virtue in such a beautiful light so that the reader, being moved by that beauty, will come to love it. And want to be like it. And, want to be like it. and that is how, that, so my belief, and your belief, because I think it's everybody's belief, is that that's what human beings are like. I think Aristotle's correct. By nature, human beings love to imitate. It marks them. They imitate what they see. And they really imitate what they love. Even more than what they hate. What marks them is by what they love. But what they hate is partly just the, the mirror reflection of what they love. This is why I hate this, because it's opposed to this. So I don't really hate this one, but I do hate the fact that if I don't fight against this, then this is all at risk. So I'm going to fight this. This is at stake. That's the reason for the fight. And defending something that needs to be defended. But yes, I agree. So even though the model of humanity has been self-expression, becoming yourself, you know, Harry Potter, you, only you can know Harry. Dum I'm Dumbledore, I can't tell you, but you will know, right? The power is within you, I, you know, whatever. We're, we're all waiting to see what you're going to do. We're all, all the old schoolmasters standing around waiting and, never, oh, it's here. <sighs> Come on. It's so, it's so ridiculous. Anyway, um, and the dialogue, trite and terrible, but... And it doesn't really move. And do you want to become like Harry Potter after watching a Harry Potter movie? I mean, if you're a kid, you might go on and you make noises and whatever, but it, it's just sort of fun. You can buy the paraphernalia, the capes, the wands, whatever, and learn some words. And Okay, but it's not really you want to be like that. If you read about the saints of old, if you read about um, knights who fight dragons, you want to Im imitate that. You, that's not Harry Potter. There's, n there's nothing there. So this is why these tales move people, but this is why these tales are not taught in schools that are run by the conditioners. Because as soon as you expose them to that, that's what they want to read. Don't give me that garbage. Give me that, and I will read that. All kids like this. Um, it, it, because it, it, it's engaging with reality, or what does he call it, enacted ideas. They want to live a world of enacted ideas. They want to be able to live it out. 
not just play it on a video game. You can complain about kids playing video games. Why do they play video games? Because they can enact that reality in a way that they're not allowed to on the playground or in life. That's why people find it attractive. So give, rather than condemn them for pursuing bad things, give them good things. That's, that's what Lewis does. I'm convinced he does that. He shifts his apologetics and his fiction go hand in hand. They're just, but the one is he thinks is more powerful and effective than the other. And I, I tend to think he's right. And it's not to disparage apologetics because it's necessary. It helps people to see and distinguish. Anyone else? Comments? Questions? OK, next time we will move on to um, Narnia. We will read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It's the first one he wrote. It's not the first one in the series chronologically, The Magician's Nephew's that, but let's do that one first. Uh, I think it's important you do them in the order in which he wrote them. Okay? See you next time.